the United States is in a declining position in the world economy. It has been, but now it's being felt. You could pretend it wasn't there. You could deny it. There are plenty of people who do that still. But it's getting harder and harder as these tariffs and sanctions all show. That's the most important thing to understand. Every country in the world, and I want to underline every, is rethinking its entire foreign economic policy and your political alliances. Look at the departure of Americans from Niger and Africa and being replaced by Ru Russian troops. This is all signs. You'd have to be really blind or desperate not to see all that's going on. Hello, welcome back, everyone. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Professor Richard Wolf, who is one of my favorite experts on economics. Professor Wolf taught economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst for nearly 30 years. Earlier, he taught economics at Yale University. Professor is currently a visiting professor in the graduate program in international affairs of the New School University in New York City. And in addition to that, Professor Wolf is an author and co-founder of the organization Democracy at Work. I'm sure many of you are very well familiar with it. Um, and they do have a popular YouTube channel where Professor shares frequent economic updates, interviews, and so much more. Uh, please be sure to follow the link in the description below to stay up to date on Professor Wolf's latest work. Professor, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. Well, let's get started with probably one of the um, most burning questions today. I have several topics that I would love to discuss with you. One of the most pressing ones is, of course, uh, the national debt. We're nearing $35 trillion in national debt. The government is adding roughly $1 trillion every 100 days, which is completely um, surreal. It is out of control. And uh, the interest cost... Uh, to service that wall of debt is now expected to surpass all other government programs, which is something that I think people really need to understand. And uh, that uh, relates to defense spending, to Medicare and Social Security. So the worst part about this is that as trillions of dollars are mounting on, there's really no value that's actually added, that's actually created for the American people. So what is the plan here, if there is one? Well, the basic answer to your question, which is a good question, is that there is no plan, that this is a process in which uh, political uh, urgency drives endless expansion of the debt. And let me try in a very simple but clear way uh, to explain this. We have a bizarre kind of capitalism in the United States. And by bizarre, I mean it puts our politicians in a very strange and awkward position. On the one hand, corporations want the government to do lots of expensive things for them. They want them to maintain a global military to protect buying and selling around the world, uh, which the United States does as much or more than any other country on earth. And it wants to protect its ability to get materials, to get them for a good price, and having hundreds and hundreds of military bases around the world, which is very expensive, not to mention the wars, which are even more expensive, is part of the cost of servicing what corporations want. At the same time, those corporations resent and fight against paying taxes which would be the way the government gets the revenue to then do what the corporations want the government to do. All right, let's take a look then, not at the corporations for a moment, but at the mass of working people. They too have things they want and need from the government to do. Everything from Social Security and Medicare to maintaining the roads, to helping finance schools, education, hospitals, and all the rest. 
And like the corporations, the mass of people don't want to spend the taxes to pay for all of that. So we have corporations and working people, both of whom put demands on the government to do things which cost the government money, and yet at the same time, the corporations and the mass of people don't want to pay taxes. Last point, the corporations have enormous wealth to get the government to do what they want, and the mass of people do not. That is, nobody has so far organized the mass of people to put together the amount of money that might someday enable them to influence the government. But right now, and for most of the history of capitalism, the division of the income in a society between corporations and the people and between rich and the mass of people puts the overwhelming bulk of the wealth in the hands of corporations and the rich. And now what everybody knows who's honest, the corporations and the rich have been very successful in removing the burden of taxation off of themselves and onto the mass of people. This has been going on for the last century. And now here comes the point. After a certain level, the mass of people revolt. They say we will not pay more taxes. They make it impossible for politicians to keep doing what they've been doing, which is shifting the burden. For example, in case people are not familiar, we used to rely on the income tax, which is a progressive tax. The higher your income, the higher the percentage you have to pay. Then when corporations were strong enough, they got that changed. Half of what the government raises now is it, it, money off of Social Security, withholding from the weekly check of an American. That's not a progressive tax. That does not go up in percentage as you get richer. In fact, if you earn more than $160,000 a year, which rich people in this country do, you don't pay on what's above $160,000. Only the average people pay. So, Look at how successful corporations and the rich have been in shifting the taxes, but they can't anymore. The mass of people won't allow it. They vote out anybody who raises their taxes. Okay, now the politicians are in a jam. They are demand, the corporations and the people demand services but they can't squeeze more taxes out of the masses and the corporations and the rich have basically bribed their way out of paying much in the way of taxes. So what is the government going to do? What do the politicians do? Answer, they borrow money. The way they keep spending on the corporations and on the people is not by taxing, but by borrowing the money. And that's why the borrowing is getting bigger and bigger. And all the national debt is, is the accumulation of annual deficits over the years. And they're going crazy now because the government, desperate, desperate to hold on to political power, is spending money like there's no going out of style. The most Im impressive example, funding the war in Ukraine huge amounts of money simply spent out funding the Israeli activity in Gaza, which we are also doing in the form of military supplies that are effectively given to the Israelis uh, at, at little or no cost. So wars, military expenditure, everything is being spent without the ability to make the beneficiaries of that spending pay for it in taxes because it, it, it's impossible for the politicians to survive if they would dare do that. If you tax corporations and the rich, they will fund whoever runs against you in the next election. So you're gone. And for the mass of people, they are so stressed right now that if you tax them an, an inch more, you really will have a popular revolt. It's a sign that American capitalism is in a very bad place. 
We are not the great economy our political leaders would like us to believe, neither Republicans nor Democrats. We are in very serious trouble. And one measure of that is that this political absurdity of our politicians having to borrow more and more because they don't have the courage to tax means that we are in the situation you described. We are loaded up with debt in a way that we used to identify with countries that were in trouble economically around the world. Now we don't hear that so much because it applies to us in terms of the ratio of the debt to the national uh, income. And make no mistake, the debt matters. People who are seeing this explosion are trying to calm the American people. Well, it's not so important. Most of the debt is a debt of the government, uh, the Treasury, to the Federal Reserve, which is another part of the United States government. All of that is true, but it is not relevant. It's not relevant because, in the end, the government has to raise the money to pay the interest on this enormous debt. And that means more and more of the money you and I pay in taxes in the United States is not going to give us a useful service. It's going to pay off whoever lent money to the government. And here's the last step. The fundamental injustice of the national debt is often overlooked. Who lends money to the United States government? But the minute you understand this, you will see. It's rich people and corporations, and to some extent, foreign corporations and foreign governments. The mass of people are not in a position, they don't have any extra money to lend to the government. So they don't. The mass of people pay the taxes that are used to pay the interest to corporations and the rich who are in a position to lend to the government. If you see that, here comes the punchline of punchlines. You will understand that when the politicians borrow money, they are doing an enormous service to corporations and the rich because they're basically saying to them, we will not tax you. Instead, you shall take the money that we could have taken from you in taxes, and instead, we will borrow it from you. And after a few years, we'll give it back to you. And during that time, we'll pay you interest on the money that we've borrowed from you. So for corporations, this is a no-brainer. Of course, it's better to have the government borrow from you than to tax you as corporations and the rich. So that's why they tolerate it. And that's why the mass of people, even if they don't understand the economics, understand they're being ripped off. And the deficit is a mechanism for ripping off the mass of people who pay the cost of it, whereas the benefit goes to the corporations and the rich who are the only ones to to be able to lend to the government. One last point. Foreign governments are also able to lend money to the United States government. And most of the people watching this program probably don't know that the two largest lenders to the United States government are Japan and the People's Republic of China, ranking one and two among foreign lenders. China has somewhere around $800 billion lent to the United States government. That is money that the Chinese lend to the United States government, which the United States government can and does use in part to fight a war in Ukraine where China is helping the Russians. If that sounds like a strange arrangement, welcome to modern capitalism. This might strike you as even stranger. With $800 billion of U.S. debt, The United States has to tax all of us, which it does, to raise the money, which it then sends to Beijing in interest on all the debt that the Chinese own of the United States government. 
which means that part of the money China uses to build up its military is the money we American taxpayers deliver to them. It's the way capitalism has organized the world. And it's not the least of the absurd contradictions that this system is living with and imposing on all of us. Professor, you mentioned so many important key points. You said that effectively taking on more and more debt is a burden for future generations. It's, it's something that future generations will have to deal with somehow. And it's also part of why we're seeing um, the middle class in the United States uh, struggling. And um, there are forecasts and projections that say that effectively it is disappearing and there's going to be a wider, a widening gap between the um, to put it very simply, between the, the poor and, and the rich, those who have and those who do not have uh, means to uh, effectively survive and, and uh, function in the society. And you mentioned a very, very important point that I would like to sort of uh, a bit expand on. You said capitalism, as we know it, is, um, is, is dying. It's, 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 it's already changed. And uh, maybe we could speak a, a bit about the uh, latest um, tariffs and sanctions that the United States um, uh, implemented, uh, put in place on Chinese goods. So we know that the U.S. has a wide range of economic sanctions. It's historically uh, been doing this, and it has sanctions on Russia, of course, on Iran, on Venezuela, China, and, and other countries. And so this week, this past week, new trade tariffs on Chinese, uh, Chinese goods were announced. These tariffs are very heavy. They range from 25 to 50 percent and cover a variety of products, not just semiconductors and um, uh, precious uh, precious metals or raw earth minerals, I should say, uh, what's actually behind these new tariffs? Because the current administration is telling us that while we put them in place for your own good, we put them in place as a protectionist measure to protect our consumers and our producers. Is that really the case or is there something else behind this move? Um, okay. Let's let's talk about that. The first thing is to remember very simply that putting tariffs on a vast array of products um, is what we call protection. You are protecting the industries inside your country by hampering the competition they face from abroad. Now, let's take the most egregious example of these new tariffs. Uh, that were implemented this last week against China by the United States. The most extreme example is the electric car and truck, where the tariff, which was already in place at 27.5%, was raised to 100%. Let me explain briefly what that means. Imagine an electric car or truck made in China. I should tell everyone that China is now the world's number one producer of electric cars and trucks. They have figured out over the last 10 years that people have been competing in various parts of the world to produce a profitable electric vehicle as the way our society is going to replace the horrible pollution of the gas a powered automobile with an electric automobile. Put aside whether that is an adequate climate control response, it isn't, but let's deal just with the tariff question. Okay, the Chinese have done it. They've won that competition, hands down. They produce the highest quality at the lowest price. So the competition has happened. Lots of companies here in the United States have been working and producing electric vehicles and the batteries needed to power them, but the Chinese have won that. They, their system, which you can think about, has been able to mobilize their scientific talent, their technology, their corporations, private and public, and they've won the competition. So if the world were going to buy the best, cheapest electric vehicle, we would all be buying Chinese. Much of the world is doing that, including Europe, where the Chinese cars and trucks, you see them on the road, not a problem. 
but no American sees them. Why? Because the 27.5% tariff means that whatever the Chinese charge for their trucks, electric trucks and, and cars, you have to pay that price to the Chinese if you were an American, plus 27.5% going to Uncle Sam as the tariff. That prices the Chinese out of the American market. You're going to make this even worse because Americans know and have told our government that the Chinese continue to improve their technology so that they're going to be even cheaper and even better than the Americans and others competing with them are likely to be for years into the future. That's how far ahead the Chinese have uh, achieved. Okay, so we are now raising it to if the car costs $20,000 that you're buying from China to pay to the Chinese, you'll have to add another $20,000 and pay $40,000 here in the United States because you have to pay twenty dollars to U.S. government in tariff on top of the twenty dollars to China. This effectively protects everybody producing a car here in the United States. If it costs, and just for simple arithmetic, if it costs $35,000 in the United States to produce a roughly similar truck or car, well, then you can sell it at 35. You could sell it at 36, 37, 38, because it would always still be cheaper to buy that car than the $40,000 you would have to pay for the Chinese. That's why it's called protection. And it is mostly occurring because the losers of a competition don't want to pay the price of having lost the competition. There's no nice way to say this. And nobody should be fooled when the losers of the competition insist that the winner cheated. Yeah, that's what they always say. It's never their fault. It's not they didn't develop the technology. They didn't develop the, the expertise in batteries. They didn't. No, 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 no. They did everything right. The other side is cheating. Uh, Secretary of the Treasury Yellen went to China and invented an entirely new economics. Excess capacity, she said. The Chinese produce huge factories. Of course they do. That's how they achieve their efficiency. It's called economies of scale. It's something we teach economic students in the first year. If you produce a lot of something, you can bring down the cost per unit of what you produce. So you always build in excess capacity. Competitive enterprises do it all the time. It's part of American economic history. She's just counting, Ms. Yellen is, on people not understanding these basics. And so finding this to be some sort of argument as if the Chinese have cheated. No, they didn't. They outdid you. Co competition always has winners and losers. And I know that here in America, I'm a born and raised here, we cannot imagine the United States losing ever anything. But we do. We lost the war in Vietnam. We lost the war in Afghanistan. We're in the process of losing it in Ukraine. But Americans need to believe that we're always winning. The tariffs are a sign that American dominance, which we got used to after World War II, from the second half of the 20th century, was the dominance of the United States. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, it left the United States in what uh, political scientists like to call a unipolar moment. But that's over now. The United States isn't what it was, and the Chinese and their allies have become a powerful new competitor. And the United States is having a hard time adjusting, which I can understand. It's like the British. It took them a century to realize that the British Empire wasn't there anymore, and some of them still haven't understood it. The United States is at an earlier stage. The sanctions you see... The tariffs you see 
That's a switch to protectionism by a society that has no confidence in its own company's ability to compete. We used to. That's when the U.S. was the champion of free trade around the world. That's because we could win in those situations. We were the most technologically dynamic. We were the fastest growing, but we're not anymore. And we haven't been for a generation now. And it's beginning to impact us day by day. And nobody should be fooled by leaders who continue to sanction and to tariff as if we were free to do that without consequences. Here's the most important bottom line for Americans. If you raise the price of the tariff, if you raise the cost of imported goods, whether they are solar panels or semiconductor chips or electric vehicles or any of the other items, if you put a tariff on them, it means everything coming in from abroad costs much more which allows the American competitors to charge more than they could have ever gotten away with if they had had to compete. And if everybody does that, you know what that contributes to? Inflation. We're supposed to be a nation worried about inflation. Tariffs are inflationary, and they always have been. And so the irony here is you're flailing around this is mostly political posturing. Mr. Biden is worried about voters in Michigan, which is where a lot of automobiles that burn gas are produced. So he's going to so say, I'm not protecting your job. Look, the inflation is pricing people out of the supermarket, out of the department store across America. That means fewer jobs in supermarkets and fewer jobs in department stores. And those lost jobs are more in number than the ones you're protecting in the auto industry. So the, the honest statement here is, this is mostly political posturing whose net effect on the economy is not going to be very significant one way or the other. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I um, uploaded a quick video the other day on, on this particular topic, just very high level video. And one of the questions that I received from a viewer was, well, why are you saying that tariffs are bad? Tariffs will allow our producers to produce more. But you, you just summed up the effect that these tariffs will have on consumers and businesses so, so well. And I think yeah. what you just said answers that question just um, very, very um, uh, directly. Let me let, thank you, but let me amplify it a bit more. The price of electric vehicles here in the United States will either be the $40, to use my example, that we have to give to China, 20 to China for the car, 20 to Uncle Sam for the tariff. Or we will have these artificially protected high prices for electric vehicles produced here. But now keep in mind, in the rest of the world, our competitors can buy the cars they need, the trucks they need at $20. They buy it from China, the best and the cheapest. So what goes into producing goods and services in Europe or in Asia or Africa or Latin America are cheap cars and trucks, which will allow them to not raise their prices of final goods the way Americans will have to, because we're having to pay $40 for the same Chinese truck instead of 20 or an inflated price for our protected Amer American producers, which means our prices will not be competitive with those of, of people producing in the part of the world where they can buy the cheap Chinese truck. That's going to hurt our exports. We are losing our export market, and that hurts employment in the United States. So it is simply not correct to say it's protecting jobs here. It's protecting some jobs here in the auto industry, 
at the price of other jobs affected by the consequences of protecting the auto. That's the honest answer. And if a clever student raises his or her hand and says, well, which is larger, the protected auto jobs or all the other jobs? The answer is nobody knows because that work depends on what's going to happen in the future. It depends on all the other things. But the simplistic notion, the tariff was good for jobs, that's not true. And that is either said out of ignorance or more likely among the politicians. It's good for a headline. It pleases the people there. And we hope nobody does the little bit of extra thinking that you and I are doing in this conversation. Absolutely. And what's really interesting is that uh, a couple of days ago, um, the United States reportedly threatened to sanction any country that signs trade deals with Iran. So are we effectively, you know, we, we, we've got China, we've got Russia, now Iran, well, well, Iran has been sanctioned, but now they're they're saying, well, we'll sanction anyone who even dares to do any business with Iran. So are we now effectively going after the BRICS bloc individually, not as a whole, but country by country? Yes. The BRICS, for everybody who doesn't know, China and its allies. The world economy is now split in a way it hasn't been for 75 years. Sorry. The world is now split in a way it hasn't been for 75 years. For most of the last 75 years, the dominant economic bloc in the world was the United States and its allies. These days, this is called the G7. The United States, Canada, Japan, Britain, France, Germany, and Italy. Those seven countries were the dominant reality of the world economy. That is no longer true. There is now a second block of countries, namely China and its allies. They are called the BRICS because the first five that got together, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, and South Africa, and a, and a half dozen more that have joined since. To give you an idea, uh, as of 2023, last year, the total GDP, the total output per year of goods and services in the G7 was around 29% of the total output of the world. If you look at the BRICS, their output, all of it, was about 33%. In other words, as a block, the BRICS are already a bigger economic unit than the G7. That is a momentous change. And it's a gap getting bigger with each passing year. They were roughly equal in 2020. They're already significantly far apart in 2023. It's going very fast. The United States is in a declining position in the world economy. It has been, but now it's being felt. You could pretend it wasn't there. You could deny it. There are plenty of people who do that still. But it's getting harder and harder as these tariffs and sanctions all show. That's the most important thing to understand. Every country in the world, and I want to underline every, is rethinking its entire foreign economic policy to take account of the fact that there are now two power blocks. If you need to improve your exports or your imports or get a loan, or get investment. You don't just go to London or Paris or New York. You can now go to New Delhi or you can go to Beijing or you could, it's a whole new world. And your political alliances, look at the departure of Americans from Niger and Africa and being replaced by Ru Russian troops. This is all signs. You'd have to be really blind or desperate not to see all that's going on. Look at the miscalculation in, in Ukraine, my God, the West thought it was fighting a war with an isolated Russia. Wrong. Russia could turn and did turn to China and India and Brazil and got enormous amounts of help, meaning that the West misunderstood, which is why the West has had to escalate the fight and is still losing as a result. I mean, this you're making colossal mistakes because you don't want to face 
how the world economy has changed and what that uh, what that really means. Last point. There are many studies, many books, articles about sanctions, like the one you mentioned. If anybody trades with Iran, well, then, 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 then. Okay, this is lovely. You know what this means? Very little. Countries that were trading with Iran will now make an arrangement. They will make an understanding with some third country. We're going to ship what we used to ship to Iran to you. You have a relationship with Iran that is different from ours. You are too important for the United States to bother with. So we'll work through you. It's a little extra cash to pay for the extra expenses, a little more record keeping. But sanctions are evaded. That is the history of sanctions. The more you put them down, the more the people you put them on figure out ways around it. It's a little bit like tax law in the United States. Every year, Congress rewrites the taxes, and every year, people who used to be in Congress are now private accountants, and they advise their rich clients how to get around the latest. And then the government adjusts the law, and the uh, people who evade the law adjust the evasions. And this silliness is good for headlines, but doesn't change the basic situation. Russia did not stop doing in, in Ukraine what it's doing because you hit them with the mother of all sanctions. Iran didn't change its government. Last month, over the, over the last month, uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, Yellen and the Secretary of State Blinken went to China, urging them to change their system. The Chinese must look at them and say, over the last 25 years, we have grown our economy two to three times faster than yours, year in and year out. That's why you're here visiting us. We are the greatest escape from poverty the world has ever seen. Over a billion people escaping poverty in a generation. It's unheard of. Nobody in their right mind would come here urging us to change a system that has worked this well. You can't. What are you doing? It's ridiculous. And you know, most of the world looks at it, at it that way. Only here in the United States does it seem reasonable for the United States to go to China after 25 years of doing less well, giving them advice on making their system look more like ours. Wow. Absolutely. And those trips by uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen and uh, Anthony Blinken, um, State Secretary, they were nothing short of embarrassing. It just, yeah. it just when you when you look at it and you're you're just kind of thinking, how could this be? It's unimaginable to think that uh, you know, like China or or any other country comes to the United States and tries to tell us, oh, you need to stop producing, you need to stop doing this or that because it's it's not in our favor. But that is precisely what they did. And it certainly didn't really go over very well. And I think the um, this past week with uh, Vladimir Putin's visit to China and so many new trade agreements and um, the way he was um, received and kind of the overall coverage of that visit, it proved that, that China probably didn't really uh, take uh, Blinken's or Yellen's visit seriously anyway. And this past week may have been a response to those uh, forms of, of, of trying to force uh, force them to change their trade policy, to change their uh, policies in general. Do you feel that this past week was a message that they sent or was, was this sort of a, a, a new step towards multipolarity and uh, economic development for uh, countries that have been developing but now found this new block where they can uh, sort of um, play off of each other and, and help each other grow the BRICS block? I think my answer is it's both. I mean, I, I am as you are. I find it embarrassing that these leaders from the United States are so tone deaf that they cannot imagine how what they are doing looks to people in the rest of the world. I mean, American foreign policy on many levels, ever since at least Henry Kissinger back in the 1970s, so half a century ago, 
has been devoted to preventing a, an alliance between Russia and China. So you'd have to say that everything of the last 50 years is a colossal failure because Russia and China are closer together now than arguably they've ever been. You know, back in the 1960s, uh, Russia and China came to military blows against one another on the border between their two countries, even though both were, were you know, organized under a, a communist party, the Russian, the Soviet one and, and the Chinese one. So here they are now, Russia quite different, rejected its revolution, China still with its communist party. And now they are, even though they're different in this important way, they're closer together than ever. That's really a product of American po policy. It's not only that American policy failed to keep them separate, but American policy gets a good bit of the credit for bringing them together, especially with this war in Ukraine, which if they had understood what they were doing, which they clearly didn't, they would have understood this is a possible side effect, which makes the whole project an idiocy to undertake, not even to speak of the terrible damage done to the people and country of Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you're seeing, in my view, all the signs of a decaying empire, of a decaying capitalism. You know, capitalism always has moved. Let's be economic historians together just for a moment. You know, here I live in the United States, our, the history of our country. We once had capitalism dynamic and growing in the area called New England, Maine, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and so on. Then eventually it moved into what we call the mid-Atlantic states, New York, Pennsylvania, and so on. Then it moved to the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. Then it moved to the South and the Far West, California, uh, and so on. And it left behind empty factories, depressed economic units. In recent decades, it's left the United States altogether. General Motors produces more cars in China than it does in the United States. Ditto for Ford and so on. Well, guess what, friends? Capitalism, looking for profits, goes where the profits are the highest. And over the last 30 years, what China has done, no great secret, it has said to the world's capitalists, come here. We want you, we welcome you, we offer you an educated, disciplined labor force, much cheaper than what you pay your workers in Western Europe or North America or Japan. And because we are growing, we offer you the fastest growing market. And because we have a huge population, it's the world's biggest and fastest growing market. Well, I've been a professor at business schools, and I can assure you, we teach the students who are the future business leaders that if you want your business to succeed, you go where the wages are low and the market is growing. That's what you do. And so capitalists have left the United States, Western Europe, and Japan, and moved into China, India, Brazil, and if you don't like that, if it depresses you about what that means, that all of America is now experiencing the decline that New England and Mid-Atlantic experienced half a century ago, then the problem for you is capitalism, not this or that detail. It's a system that goes to where the profits are, and the profits are not here unless you create them artificially. Tariffs give you artificial profit opportunities by being able to jack up the prices. But that, that's called an inflation, has other very negative consequences. The poor capitalists are stuck. What they do to solve a problem makes another problem worse. That's another sign of decline. And this may be a naive question, but you mentioned economic decline. You mentioned uh, a 
you know, dying empire, uh, essentially. And um, so this may be a naive question. I just want to preface it with that. But why do you feel the U.S. foreign policy has been so unwilling to adapt to this changing landscape internationally in terms of um, centers of power and in terms of economic changes that uh, move profits to countries that are just like China, that have a lower cost um, of labor and that are emerging in terms of uh, their market? Well, the United States at this point is stuck on its own on its own history. It, it can't adjust. You know, it has developed a society which told itself and its people that profit, the profit motive is the royal road to prosperity and success. Let companies pursue the profit. And well, over the last 30 years, companies did that. They pursued the profit and they went to China or they went to India or they went to Brazil, which they're still doing. And so Americans were stuck. What were they going to say? We don't believe in the profit motive. The results of the profit are not good for us. They would have to rethink the entire pro-capitalist ideology that private pursuit of profit leads to the best outcome for everybody. Look, that's what's taught in the universities where I've been a professor all my life. That's what was taught to me. And I went to all the elite universities here. That was the ideology. And the problem is that misunderstands that capitalism is, in fact, a profit-driven system, and it will therefore go where the profits dictate. If you're the place to which profit dictates investment, you're having a good time. You're having the second half of the 20th century in the United States. But if you're living in a country which isn't the profit attractor, because that's somewhere else, China, India, then you're going to be on the bad side of the profit motive. That's what's forcing itself into the consciousness of the United States. They're now seeing that free trade and profit-driven is what lost the jobs. You referred to it earlier correctly about the disappearing middle class. They're beginning to understand. That's why we have the support for Mr. Trump. He at least sounds different, doesn't do anything different, but he at least sounds like he's going to do something different, whereas Mr. Biden sounds like the same old, same old continuum. And that puts Mr. Biden in a very dangerous position because he is not responding in the minds of millions of Americans to the felt economic crisis. This is a generation of Americans who don't believe that their children are going to have a higher standard of living than they do. When I was growing up in the United States, that was assumed to be somehow the magic benefit of being an American. Each generation would live better. You will live better than your parents. They lived better than your grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was just built in to what came to be called American exceptionalism, that it was, it was nothing exceptional at all. It was that profits were better here for all kinds of reasons. And capital came here. And when profits became better somewhere else, capital left. And it, and the politicians don't know what to do. You know, their ideology was free market. That didn't work out. They're now switching to economic nationalism, protecting everywhere, sanctioning, funding this company, funding that company. Billions have been given, uh, for example, to Elon Musk. The production of electric vehicles in this country by Tesla is a government-funded project. Americans don't want to face that. But if they hadn't done that, then he would have done everything elsewhere or he wouldn't have done it at all. The government is crucial, not just when we collapse, like in 2008 and 9, and the government had to come in and bail out the banks, or in 2020, 21, when the government had to save us from the COVID pandemic. The government is continuously now being brought in because this capitalism cannot compete. 
And that takes us right back to the beginning of our conversation. We can't compete with the electric vehicles either. And so we're protecting without facing that this is going to worsen the inflation that we're supposed to be fighting. These kinds of absurdities, these are signs. It's like a doctor reading a patient, your body. There are signs that a medical trained person can see that you've got some serious issues to deal with. It's not just that you have a rash here or a pain over there. There's something more fundamental going on, and hopefully they can figure it out and treat it. We're in that situation, except we have a country whose politicians have to end every speech by saying we are in the greatest economy in the greatest... It's no longer true. The wages aren't the highest here. The standard of living isn't the high. It's all not true, but we have a cheerleading political environment that hasn't yet been broken. Although, I must tell you, the number of people that I encounter as an American who are questioning capitalism, I've never seen that in my entire life, what I am seeing around me now. And the willingness of young people, particularly young people, to challenge and question what the government is doing. Well, you can see it on the campuses around Israel and Gaza, but that's the tip of the iceberg. They're questioning everything, and that's because they're not being offered the jobs they were taught to expect. They are not being offered the economic future they were taught to expect. And they are asking the questions that intelligent human beings have always asked when things don't work the way they're supposed to. And uh, you mentioned that even younger people are starting to sort of think, well, things aren't really going as we're told on, you know, in, in the mainstream media. So yeah. people are starting to realize that these changes that we're facing, they're not going to, um, it's not something that will impact us. 50 years from now, this is something that's already impacting our us, our society, our purchasing power. So uh, maybe um, my last question for you uh, for this video, what is uh, what would be fair to say um, would be um, the economic developments or the situation five or 10 years from now, just based on these processes that uh, you just described? Here's what I think is going on. And of course, you know, the future is always a guess, your guess, my guess, and I, I don't claim any more than that. But here's my guess. I see, particularly, again, the younger generations asking questions about the economic system much bolder, much deeper than I have ever seen before. And, and certainly that was true of my generation when I was a university student. And so I've asked myself, where is this going? And the answer I've come up with is the following. These young people are not going to be persuaded that voting for a Democrat versus a Republican, or for that matter, vice versa, that's not the solution. They, they understand the problems are deeper and that these people are fundamentally puppets of the way the system is laid out. You know, a couple of days ago, the Washington Post carried an article, which I found remarkable. Uh, someone had given them the transcript of a WhatsApp conversation. And it was a conversation among very rich corporate people discussing how much money they were going to give and what kind of support they were going to give to the mayor of New York, Adams, to have the police in New York intervene at Columbia, at NYU, to squash the uh, protesters around the Gaza uh, activity, okay? Uh, there it is. The young people know this. They didn't know those details, those are new, but they, it confirms what people have begun to understand, that if you live in a system that produces great wealth at one end, and mass of people having a kind of hard time getting through, uh, you're going to literally create in those people the use of the money that has been concentrated in their hands to do whatever they want. So if, for example, these people are very uh, supportive of Israel, in this case, that was the case, they want to shut down these protests. 
that support uh, Palestinians and, and Gaza and all that. So they offer money and they are listened to. The mayor answers the phone. These are important donors. They talk about donating more to him so he can be reelected. The money is doing what it's doing. It's showing the young people, and they've learned it, that we have the best government money can buy. But that's not the government they want. And they're now smart enough to understand the problem really isn't in the government. The government is acting out what an unequal society will make it do. And that has always been true. you know. And therefore, you got to deal with that. Well, how do you deal with the horrible inequality that allows a few people to shape what a, a mayor of the biggest city in the country does over the telephone against young people who are peacefully protesting in the university where they are students? Well, the young people are asking basic questions. So now I'll tell you why that's the answer to your question. They understand that the origin of the inequality is inside the enterprise. It's inside the factory, the office, the store. And it comes out of the way those are organized. Because in all of them, factories, offices, and stores, a tiny group of people, the owner of the business, uh, the board of directors, if it's a corporation, they have all the power. They make the decision what is going to be produced, what technology is going to be used, where the production will occur, and then a big one, how to utilize what to do with the revenue you get from running the business. All of that's decided. A board of, uh, board of directors in an American corporation is usually between 10 and 20 people. They may hire 10,000, but it's 10 and 20 individuals who sit around they usually meet four times a year, and they make those decisions. And guess what? They give the money, the revenue, the debt, the profit, whatever you want to call it. They give it to the shareholders, who are the ones who elect them to be on the board, or to the top executives, which often includes themselves. In other words, the people at the top take the lion's share of the net revenue of the enterprise, which should surprise nobody. They're the people who run it. They're in a position to do it, and they do it. Boeing Aircraft, who has had one safety disaster after another for the last several years, just raised, raised the annual pay of their departing CEO, a Mr. Calhoun, from the 20. Two million he got last year, uh, twenty in twenty twenty two, to thirty three million for twenty twenty three. He presided over the worst safety record any modern air, airline has ever uh, uh, achieved. Okay, there's no connection between what he did and what he's paid, and the board of directors voted him. That money was not just him. It, that's how the, they take care of themselves. So here's where we're going. I think five or 10 years from now, this generation will have put on the agenda a radical change in the organization of the enterprise, the factory, the office, and the store. It's going to be called, I suspect, the democratization of the enterprise. All enterprises are going to be run one person, one vote as a democratic community. No individual is going to get hundreds of millions, no Bill Gates, no Elon Musk, none of that. You can give a reward to people who make a good invention. You can honor the one who improves the technology and give them money too, sure. But basically, we are not going to function to produce this kind of inequality. And that's going to save us from rich people who buy the government. We're, none of us are going to be in a position to do that. And I think that's the kind of fundamental change we're talking about. So it'll be on a scale of deciding, for example, no longer to organize our factories, offices, and stores with masters and slaves, as in slavery, or with lords and serfs 
as in feudalism, or with employers and employees, which was capitalism. It's a new democratic organization, which will seem to the, that generation a much better, much more grounded solution to the problems that are accumulating than doing piecemeal or imagining that the leaders of our corporations today or the politicians they buy are going to help us out of the situation they have created and from which they benefit. I couldn't agree with you more. I think you brought up so many interesting points that uh, I would love to uh, hear, your, hear your thoughts on, um, hopefully in the next videos. Professor, thank you so much for such an interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it. And I know that our viewers did as well. We're definitely living in very interesting times. And yes. it seems that every single day, every week, if not every day, every week, there's something that, let's just say, surprises us, right? Something that happens and we we never thought it could happen or it would happen that exact way. So I would like to remind our viewers that uh, Dr. Wolf's YouTube channel and his website, Democracy at Work, will be linked in the video description below. Please give him a follow. He has wonderful, wonderful content, as I'm sure many of you already know. And uh, Professor, I hope you come back. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for inviting me, and I'd love to continue the conversation in the future.